Hello, Austin. I'd like to thank you for allowing me into your homes for this 38th episode of Esoteric Science Roundtable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the topic for this evening's discussion is limitation, or perhaps a better title might be transcending limitation. The concept of limitation is based on the misconception or the illusion of duality, uh, basically that we are both spirit and matter and that they are separate. But in actuality, there are two parts of one whole, and uh, evolution is at varying degrees as far as the constitution of, of uh, entities, as far as their ratio of spirit to matter, if you will. And so at the very highest level of divinity, uh, we can kind of conceive of divinity as being still or latent or being in a state of potential, but not a state of action. And so that being the case, with... Uh, with divinity at the highest level being latent and still, and then if we go on the opposite end to the lower kingdoms, at that lowest level that we can perceive, it seems as well that there is stillness, latency, and but again, there's potential. If we consider the mineral kingdom, for instance, for all intents and purposes, it seems as if a rock or a mineral is a still, latent, you know, non-active entity, but in actuality, science has proven that uh, there are atoms within the, the rock that uh, do allow for motion and activity, even within seeming stillness, with what our eyes would perceive, within what our eyes would perceive as stillness, there is still activity. And so at this highest level of divinity, there is no action. There is just, o there is only thought. And we can consider divinity as both manifest and unmanifest or again physical and non-physical and that this seeming duality is merely an illusion and that there really are two parts of one whole. Uh, but one dif as divine thought precipitates into manifest activity or as thinking is turned into action, it has to have a vehicle to work through. And so a thought has to find its way into some physical, ex physical plane expression. And that's always the case, that a thought has to find some way to turn into some action, uh, and it has to find the means to do this. And so from a point of, of latency or seeming inactivity, which is this high aspect of divinity, we find this precipitation down into our material plane in a way in which thoughts become, again, clothed as they gradually precipitate down into our physical plane, and they find themselves clothed with matter and they have to take on form. And so a thought has to become clothed in form at some level in order for it to have a body, a vehicle, for action, for activity. And so the whole process, <clears throat> as far as that goes, a thought starts obviously on the mental, as our, in, our, in our mental apparatus or on the mental plane, and then it, it finds its way down into the astral or desire plane, and then through our energy or our vital or etheric body, it finally makes its way down to the physical, and then it demonstrates as some activity that we can see through some through some physical expression. And so that whole <clears throat> so that whole method, uh, as far as the stepping down process, as, as far as how that's concerned, uh, it does it does have to start again with a thought, with with thinking, with mind, and then it has to find its way into something uh, as far as activity. Mind, obviously, is abstract. It's not uh, something that we can touch, taste, see, or feel, but yet we do have evidence that mind is an actual principle. And uh, once we understand more so how mind works in relation to the physical brain, we can understand more so of how thought becomes eventually clothed with matter and becomes some expression of activity. Now, all... Uh, would generally agree upon things that are apparent and obvious or what is termed objective. Uh, if there's a car in a, in a park, parking lot, if three people gather around, they'll probably all be able to generally more or less say, yes, it's a, a green car, it's a, this make or model. You know, those things that are, these outer appearances, for the most part, most people can agree upon. And what is, you know, a, what is apparent, obvious, or objective, most people generally do agree upon, but then there is also the conversely or uh, the opposite of this objective outlook is a subjective outlook, and that is each person's individual 
outlook on, on some, some thing. And that, uh, that also ties in as far as limitation because each person is going to have their own pet beliefs, their own pet theories. And so their belief system, if you will, is going to be limited by their life experience, their level of understanding, their, le their level of awareness. And so that being the case, what each individual person believes in their own heart of hearts, what is subjective to them, may not be a truth for the next person, and the next person, and the next person. So each individual person has a level of perception. And a level of perception is our level of awareness and understanding, but at the, by the same token, it can be a prison. It can be a limiting paradigm or a limit, limiting field of expression if, uh, if we don't have a large field of perception. Now certainly that's relative as to what a large field of perception is and what is not. But uh, there are varying fields of perception at, for individuals, and so each person is going to be at, at a different level of evolution, if you will, for lack of a better term, as far as their ability to grasp the larger picture and understand their role in the larger picture. Now, form limits, and there are many examples of how form limits. Now, again, re revisiting the idea that once a thought uh, is thought, <laughs> it's put into action, it has to find some vehicle, it has to find some way to express itself, and it has to find its way through form into, for instance, words or writings. And uh, we see many examples of things that may have been oral and spoken at one time that find their way to the written word in some way, or they find themselves captured in some way, symbolically, pictograph, uh, different ways that we can capture a thought in, inside of a form. But in many instances, the form is limiting. The form, if, whether it's words we choose or a writing that we use to describe something, some idea, some concept, it's going to limit it uh, due to that person's awareness and their capacity. And, and so that being the case, it's going to be, become more personalized and less of, what it, the, the, less of the essence of what it initially, the, the original uh, essence of what it was. And so it finds its way down to the physical plane. Also in the sense of buildings. A building has dimensions, it has measurements, and we can say this building is you know, 100 feet long, 50 feet wide. Now true, we can add to the building later, and we can do some, some restructuring, and we can, we can do some additions to it, and we can change the measurements. And so there is room for growth in that respect. But even at that point, there's still limitation because yes, we've expanded the building by 100 feet on this side, but that new expression is a new, new form of limitation. So that being the case, we see that um, and with as far as man's law, man's idea of law based initially on spiritual law, divine law, and the patterns of things in the heavens that man has tried to imitate and bring down to the physical plane. And so we see man and his feeble attempt to imitate divine law has constructed for us our man-made laws that we operate and move and work through in our society. But again, that's limiting. Once an individual codifies a law and puts a law into effect, the interpretation of that law is subject to individuals, and that's why we have the court system to argue over the different points of the law, the legality of, of any, any legislation, and that sort of thing, to size up and put parameters around this law and to, to, give, it, uh, to give it some credence. But again, that it does limit it. It does because men are, are uh, subject to their own limitations and their own fallacies and their own shortcomings. And so that's going to be reflected into legislation. And oftentimes, uh, legislation is merely compromise. And so that in itself uh, also lends to the fact that laws are limited and limited and limited more so. Also, uh, education. Education is another thing that once we put rigid restraints and constraints on an education system, it, it tends to lose some of the livingness and the vitality. And so you find different expressions of education, and some are freer than others as far as what they'll allow the child to learn, what they feel they should learn at a certain age. And you find examples through the Montessori schools or through uh, the Rudolf Steiner schools, which are called also Waldorf schools. You find children allowed much more free expression 
and they're not, uh, the, the rigid constraints of the public school systems are not imposed on them in the same way, and you see the outcome from each of these uh, systems, and certain people are going to have to judge, well, people are going to have to judge uh, according to their own estimation as to which does the purpose and, and suits the child's needs more so. Um, again, uh, another aspect of how form would limit would be the limitation of spirit. Spirit is basically all-inclusive and it is uh, all-pervasive and so uh, that being the case in order for us to to uh, express spirit we have to express spirit through this limited physical vehicle and so that being the case whatever our latent capacities and whatever our abilities are each individual person that's going to be a measuring stick as to how much it, how much spirituality or divinity they're going to be able to demonstrate or express through the physical vehicle. And that boils down to level of awareness, level of comprehension, level of understanding. Again, as to how much a person can perceive and conceive of the larger picture and see their place in the whole, in the whole scheme of things and also begin to allow, if they so choose, the spiritual aspect to be the more dominating, the predominant aspect in the physical vehicle and for that to be the, the uh, directing factor in one's actions and, and, uh, and, uh, and physical plane activity. And so that being the case, each vis physical vehicle is going to be capable to a certain degree and that all ties in with point of evolution and also uh, karma as well, the law of uh, rebirth that factors in as well, as well, and I'll go into that a bit more in a second here. Um, also, the idea of a, a system of non-belief, that also, that, percep that perception of non-belief also has its own limitations as well, as far as there a person being an atheist or agnostic or any of these other systems of belief, if you can as ascribe that to these terms, and that that perception, again, is gonna be limiting to a certain degree. Now, all life has to work through form in order to gain experience. And that's all part of this, the living process. Many people will argue different reasons why we're here. Why is man here? Why has this happy accident sprung forth into some, intel some demonstration of intelligence, some organization, some activity that, that's demonstrable on the physical plane? And I'll, many people will question you know, why we're here and that sort of thing, but ultimately, the, whether, you know, regardless of the reason why you determine we're here, this is still a learning ground for us. This is still, we still gain experience, we still have to go through our life's lessons, and uh, we find our way through. We find our way through this maze one way or another, and some more successfully than others. And there, as far as learning life lessons, there are certain aspects that keep uh, people in check to a certain degree, or will also allow them a fuller expression of, of awareness, a fuller comprehension, a fuller understanding. And in particular, pain and fear. People uh, will go out of their way to avoid pain uh, at all costs. When they understand things that make them feel bad, that hurt them, that, that cause them suffering, they'll try to, you know, they, we, we work through memory, and so we remember these instances where we've, we've been hurt before, and so we at all costs try to avoid a further creation of pain, bringing more pain and suffering into our lives. So we do what we can to avoid that. And in many instances, that pain is there, well, I would say in every instance, actually, that pain is there for a reason, for us to learn from that life lesson. You know, if we want to shirk our responsibility and run from any kind of pain, tragedy, or suffering, then that's certainly our option. <clears throat> but if we can grasp the concept and understand what this pain is based upon to a certain degree, then we can eliminate it from our lives and we can overcome it as opposed to being sidetracked by it and, and fearful of suffering. Again, fear, that they tie in very intimately to one another. Afraid of the unknown, that, that fear of the unknown is one thing that really, really sidetracks many people. The what if factor and the, the concept of anxiety and panic, those also are prisons or limiting ideologies or concepts that certain things are going to lock a person in and keep them from having a fuller understanding or fuller expression. And so being fearful, for instance, if you're fearful of being around other people, if you're fear fearful of going out into the public and, and exchanging and interacting with other people that you don't know, 
you're, you're having a self-imposed prison as a result of that by limiting yourself and uh, not allowing yourself to experience what it might be like to interact with other people and, and have some exchange as a result. And so again, that's an idea or concept of, of fear limiting someone. And um, as, as far as um, some of the other concepts of fear that limit people, fear of death is a very large factor that, that plays in that causes people to be very be cautious and sometimes more cautious than they should otherwise be. Um, again, fear of death. Many people believe that we have a one-shot opportunity here and that we need to get it right and succeed and obtain some spiritual reward or if we don't get it right then we're going to fall into uh, a hell situation and that we're going to be punished for our, our wrongdoing here on the, on the earth plane, on the physical plane. And so that always has been curious to me that people that do feel that that is the case, that they uh, are convinced in their minds that it's a one-shot deal, that you've got this one life to live and that's it. Uh, why these people don't make every effort possible to live the most exemplary life of, of goodness and service and helpfulness and, and be as benign and, um, and non -hurting, not hurting as, as possible. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Generally, people look around and they say, "Oh, this guy's doing this. This guy's doing that. You know, he's uh, he's no uh, better than I am. So if he's going to have his eternal reward, then most assuredly I will as well." And so people kind of cop out that way and just say, "Oh, well, I'm getting by. I'm doing just enough to get by. So that's satisfactory because no one else seems to be doing any more than me. So I must be doing well enough or what is required of me." And so that again can be a limiting way as well. Also, people that have um, bad health. Ill health can be a limiting situation and sometimes justifiably so that people can be sidetracked by a, a health condition. Uh, some persons when they become older, old age may be a hindering factor for a person's mobility and perhaps their mental cognitive um, ability as well. And some people also feel limited by pre-existing conditions. They feel like if they weren't in the particular living establishment that they were in, if they weren't in the particular job that they're in, maybe the particular relationship that they're in. If circumstances were different, then they could have a fuller, more creative expression. That is often the belief by many people. Um, but that also is a limiting, self-imposed prison in my estimation that people keep themselves from giving out a real effort because they're waiting. They're having a sense of expectancy for things to be better. And there are those people that uh, they feel like that they're always having bad luck, if you will. I don't, I don't believe in the term luck or the, the, in the concept of luck, but uh, there are people that believe that, that, that somebody's out to get them more or less and that they can do nothing right and uh, they just kind of plot along and they're hoping, they're expectant that one day they'll get their comeuppance, they'll get their just rewards and they'll get their dessert for all of the su suffering and pain that they've had to, to live through. And so they wait in this in this sense of expectancy, in this holding pattern, waiting for something to come around that's going to be this new condition or this new impetus or something that's going to spark them to, again, some fuller, more creative expression. But again, they get caught in a holding pattern and they are waiting for some proper conditions to come around that may never come. Also, a fear of failure is something that's very prevalent in many people's estimations. And many people would rather not give any effort at all rather than try to make an effort and have a fear of failure. They are so afraid that their effort is going to not be successful, it's going to be a half-hearted half attempt, it's not going to accomplish what they want. And so by that limiting, limited thinking, they won't have the expression, it won't have the beauty and the fullness and the creativity that it might otherwise have if they were to properly feed that thought and push that thought into some expression of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so, again, some people, for fear of failure, won't make any effort at all. And I fell a victim to that for many years, too, as far as I was so concerned about putting forth the most perfect effort possible, whether it was writing a paper or any number of situations where I really felt like I really had to put forth the best possible I could possibly put forward, and anything less just wouldn't cut it in my estimation. And I've luckily gotten, well not luckily again, I don't believe in luck, but, but I've, got, I've gotten past that. I've, I've found a, a level of comprehension and a level of understanding to get past that limiting thinking. 
and to be willing to give things a try and be willing to have some expression in spite of uh, some seeming limitations, in spite of circumstances, in spite of shortcomings, one can still find a way to have some creative expression. And again, rejection. Some people have a fear of rejection if they try to bring something out, some expression out, or they try to change from their established ways that they're going to have some sense of rejection. Maybe they are with their certain group of friends and they're for fear of being rejected by their group of peers or group of friends, they'll stay with their same course of thinking, action, activity. They'll get caught in a rut because for fear of losing, again, you know, the approval of friends or family or loved ones and that holds people sometime in check and, and keeps them locked into a limited situation as well. Uh, some people have a fear of success which is very ironic but some people they are afraid of, of doing well and so they won't make an effort or they won't make a very substantiated effort to try to accomplish something. Also money is a big fear for many people too. Uh, people have a perception that they have a lack of money and so that is going to uh, give them some shortcomings or, or have, make them have some shortfalls or make them want something because they feel they don't have the, the proper funds to to get what they feel they need and that oftentimes can be just a matter of of perception as well that uh, what is it that is essential, what is really needed and what are non-essentials and to make that discernment to detach oneself from non-essentials and to understand that uh, money is a tool just like many other things and uh, not to be fearful of it and not to be overcome by a lack of money as well because we can bring money into our lives uh, it takes a concerted one-pointed effort of mind to bring money into one's life and that's a lesson I'm trying to kind of get a, get a better grasp on as well but uh, there's plenty of money out there it's just a matter of Rechanneling it into uh, into needs, and so that being the case, uh, again, some people are going to have fear if they don't have enough money. They're going to feel like they're going to they're going to feel like they have a um, a drawback from the get go, and so that again can be a perception of limitation. Uh, but but it is possible to give from very little and and to give from nothing, if you will. Um, we don't have to always buy someone a store-bought gift. We can make something. We can make something very simple that expresses our emotions, our feelings, and our thoughts. And a lot of times that will have much more significance to someone than something that we would go out and buy. And that's just a little example of that, that kind of perception of money and how people have a certain perception of, of needs, wants, and what money will be able to accomplish for them. Some people feel if they have adequate money, then all their problems will be solved. And that expectancy, that waiting to win the lottery mentality also is, in my estimation, very much a limitation and very much a, 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 a trap, a prison. And so again, pain and fear can also, by the same token, be lessons. And we can learn by this repeated pain. If we keep putting ourselves in situations where we keep uh, having pain and that could be a person in an abusive relationship for instance where they keep getting in an abusive relationship and they feel that that they're getting into a better circumstance than they were previously but they find that they're in the same rut the same mentality over and over again and they find themselves stuck in that pattern and that uh, one day perhaps something snaps at some level and they're able to understand they're able to look above the situation and see more objectively their situation and see what they can do to get out of it. Now in many instances that doesn't happen and a person stays in the cycle of abuse over and over and over again and I'm sure uh, that and I know that's very well documented. But um, at some point fear, extreme fear and extreme pain, especially a traumatic experience, a, a possibly one single event, can lead somebody and turn them around in their way of thinking and their whole lifestyle and I'm sure many of us are familiar with incidents of that as well where somebody has a complete lifestyle change as a result of some traumatic incident maybe they had a near-death experience or maybe something not quite as dramatic as that but something happens in their life that they all of a sudden reorient themselves and have a complete 180 on their perception of things and so we, we find that as well and if we consider the concept of psychology as far as the study of inner causes of uh, the delving within the unseen part of man uh, within mind and emotion 
to find solutions or at the very least to find understanding. Uh, we can understand also um, as far as a way that uh, people, we can, the study has become more prevalent as far as trying to understand what in our emotion and what in our thinking limits us and causes conditions that manifest in some way in, in some physical lack, some physical a phobia, for instance, or an anxiety, or any of these things uh, that are more prominent as we become more mentally predisposed and more specialized and highly evolved as the human race progresses, that psychology becomes more prevalent and more necessary uh, because we can find at these levels, we understand the level of emotion more so, we understand the level of mind more so, and so we can start to get at these causative, at the cause rather than the end result. And that will more so demonstrate itself in the future that the looking in, inside oneself, will give that person more, a more complete, comprehensive understanding of why they think a certain way, uh, why they react in a certain way, and all these things about oneself that one can determine through careful and close analysis of oneself. The, uh, the great saying that the Greeks had, man, know thyself, very much factors in. Now, as far as the idea of a ritual or a ceremony, these uh, concepts also tie us into some sort of a form, some sort of a structure, some sort of an established pattern. And an example of that could be the Catholic Mass. I was raised Catholic, and so I have some understanding of that, that you go and you go through the same ritual every Sunday, and you become very familiar with it after a short amount of time. and you. You know what's next, you understand, you know, okay, the priest is going to do this next, and then we say this, and then we need to kneel here, we need to do this next. And so you understand the, the pattern and the ritual and the ceremony. And so from that, uh, that's a dual effect as well. It sets up a current. It sets up a current of bringing down, invoking, if you will, a level of spirituality through that means, through that ritual. And so we can demonstrate that, and as it's demonstrated in all the churches, you know, on Sunday mornings and other services whenever they may be held, it creates that current and it sets up that current and so it makes it a path of least resistance and it makes it easier for that spirit to manifest itself if the motive is proper and good and right. And that's a key thing to consider as well. But it's basically a, a, the concept of moving energy and force and bringing in through this ritual, through this exercise, a demonstration of energy. And that's uh, part of also ritual and ceremonial magic as well that's exercised by some people, uh, de again depending on motive, would be considered either black magic or white magic. But that being the case, these set patterns, these rituals that have been used from time immemorial and that uh, found, our way into, found their way into expression in our day and age still, those also are tools that can at some level limit and uh, once someone's dogma, excuse me, once someone's doctrine is turned into a dogma, in other words, when somebody's concepts or ide ide ideological, uh, well, again, a concept, if it's, if it's concretized, if it's restrained and limited into a single interpretation, then that is an example of a doctrine turning into a dogma. And we see many examples of that in, in established religion as well, where uh, it's the my way or the highway attitude and pride factors in. Pride also, pride and vanity are very, very big prisons as well in my estimation that limit us. Because from one's pride, one may say, my religion is the only way, your religion is false. If you don't follow my way, then more, most assuredly you will burn. And that is a very common outlook that some have. And it's again based on a, based on a feeling of pride ultimately, that their way is right. They're not willing to look outside of their own individual ideology to try to even consider something outside of their, again, their paradigm, their belief system, their little box that they've created for themselves. Again, another concept of limitation uh, that constrains us, that restrains us, and, and keeps us, and also keeps us divisive at a higher level, too, because if we're not willing to at least acknowledge, in, this, in the instance of religion, uh, if we're not at least willing to acknowledge other religions and be respective of them, then we're going to have the divisiveness and the fighting that we see in the instance of uh, the Protestants and the Catholics in Ireland, and then uh, between those that follow Islam and, and those that follow the Jewish faith. We see that these upheavals 
demonstrating again and again because there is no mutual understanding. There's very little mutual understanding. There's very little mutual respect and there's no goodwill or very little goodwill between these, these factions. And so that being the case also, these tools, these, a ritual or a ceremony is most assuredly a tool, but it can also by the same token be limiting. It can be enlightening and it can demonstrate to us and uh, give us, we can exchange energy through a ritual or a ceremony, but also it can be limiting in that same sense as well. And uh, ultimately, I think uh, if we can discover what we have latent inside of ourselves, we can really, really make some, make some strides uh, forward. Now, as far as uh, energy and force are concerned, we are either the conscious movers of energy and force by our own cognitive and mental process that we, by our conscious will, move matter, uh, or um, that, that whole scientific process, or we feel tossed about and we feel that we're falling victim to circumstances, and we feel helpless, we feel helplessness, and that ultimately leads to belief in fate, to randomness, to random chance, uh, to luck, coincidence, all those things come into play as a result of not having a fuller understanding of who we are and what we have latent inside of us, the capacity that we have inside of us. Excuse me. And so we feel we have no sense of control. We feel like we're like a little boat just tossed about on the ocean with no steering mechanism. And so that we're at the, we're at the uh, control or the whims of nature or whatever, however we want to look at it. And then we start to fall into the woe is me thinking and the self-pity thinking. We feel we don't have any control in our lives, we feel like we are helpless, then we're very much going to fall into that self-doubt, self-pity, and be locked into that prison as well. And that's all part of this as well. Now if we consider uh, also karma, karma is something that factors in. The law of rebirth, the, the cycle of rebirth that dictates and determines to a large degree the type of vehicle that we incarnate in, where we incarnate, who we're born, the family that we're born into, and the, some of the life circumstances that surround that whole situation, that whole evolutionary process. And so karma is going to be limiting and releasing in some sense as well. We can learn from our karmic lessons and we can release ourselves from our attachment to form and we can uh, alleviate some of the suffering by uh, taking on a more spiritual understanding and bringing that into our lives in a very real sense. But karma is going to limit us because we have these debts to pay from previous existences. And so those existing debts, those outstanding debts are still there. We can't ignore them. And so we have to factor them in and uh, understand. It would be quite helpful to understand how that ties in and how that plays a part in anyone's evolution and what may limit one person from achieving certain uh, goals that they may have set for themselves. Another good analogy would be of the spider. The spider weaves from itself its web, its field of expression. And so as the, the web is spun from the spider, it builds out and builds out, and then it creates, for, what, uh, for all intents and purposes, what would be its limited field of expression in, in the web. And so that's basically its understanding, its field of activity, its field of expression. And we, in the same sense, esoterically, bring from ourselves our level of awareness, our level of understanding, and our level of comprehension. It comes from us in the same sense that the thread comes from the spider and the spider creates its own world, its own environment on which it enacts and, and lives and feeds and all these things that it does and, and reproduces. We see it all created in this, this sphere that the spider of the, spider's, of the spider's own making. And so it creates its field of expression, but it also creates its own limitation. So uh, whatever boundaries the spider's web has, that's going to be the limits in most cases of its expression. Sometimes the spider may hop off the web and journey out and about and then come back onto the web, but ultimately that's going to be its home base, its field of operation. And uh, that, again, also is its limitation as well. Now, many people, and this carries over into the next thing I want to discuss, which is how many people often ritualize and create patterns and psychological traps for themselves. And that falls into the idea of having a routine. Many people get into get locked in a routine and they go through the same patterns and they go through a ritual and it's a daily thing for them and so they stay locked in a pattern 
and they can't seem to get out of it because it's comfortable for them. It's a safety zone for them, and uh, they can rationalize their activities. They can rationalize what they're doing. So if it's a pattern where you come home from work, you immediately grab a drink, or maybe you have a smoke when you get home, if you're into that, uh, or something, something that you're into, or maybe you're into eating food, uh, and you're way, uh, just very much into food, and that's something that you would, uh, that would be your routine. So uh, any of these gluttonous kind of behaviors, and it may not necessarily be even gluttonous, but just the fact that you fall in a pattern. You see, you find yourself being caught in a pattern, an unend unending, unending, reoccurring pattern, and we get crystallized in our thinking. And as we set ourselves into these rigid restraints, and as we set ourselves into these ruts, and we, get, we find ourselves getting deeper and deeper into the rut, as we travel the same familiar path over and over again, over and over again, and we find ourselves caught in this way of thinking that limits us. And so that field of perception is gonna stay locked within this ritual. And so the ritual becomes all important to us, and so, we follow that pattern. We know, and we anticipate it even before we get home, for instance. Uh, if we know we're going to come home to uh, a six-pack of beer, then you're already thinking, maybe around 3 o'clock, you're thinking, man, I can't wait to get home, to bl brush off the stress of the day. I'm going to have a cool one. I'm going to chill out. Everything's going to be fine. And we get caught in that pattern. And so, again, that becomes something that we look forward to and we anticipate uh, even before the actual activity. And by the same, uh, the same token, some people are into uh, illegal drugs and this whole system that's been set up to keep us enslaved within those restraints and limits, very much by design. But there are many people that feel that the pursuit of an illegal drug is much more of a rush for them than the actual doing of a drug. And that also is a rut, is a, is a ritual, is a cycle, is a set pattern you know, that rush that, we, that one would get from that whole, from being on the hunt, if you will. And that factors in very much as well. And so it's my hope to kind of express to some individuals that may find themselves in this limited expression, in this limited thinking, that, that are aware that they're in this pattern. Some people won't be aware that they're in the rut. They'll just go through their daily routine, they'll go through their ritual, they'll go through their everyday activity, their familiar patterns, not realizing that they're doing the same thing, recurring over and over again. Just another day but the same thing over and over again. And we become so ingrained in this ritual and so comfortable in this pattern that we've developed for ourselves. Anything outside of that routine would possibly cause us pain or perceived pain and suffering. And it's just like the baseball players that feel that they need to go through these elaborate uh, elaborate things to uh, give themselves good luck. They're very superstitious in that sense and they feel if they don't do a certain thing they're not going to have the success that they had previously. So they find themselves doing all kinds of strange things on a ritual basis, you know, wearing a certain pair of shoes, doing this, doing that, wearing certain things a certain way that uh, become important for them and that, is, that takes on added significance and so if they don't have those things set up right their head is off and their thinking is off and so their whole mindset is, is, out, is out the window because they weren't able to follow through this pattern, this ritual. And as we find ourselves stuck in these rituals and we begin to rationalize them, uh, that is very much a prison. Now, there are some that are aware that they're in a rut, but they are yet to be able to pull themselves out of the rut. They see that there's light at the, the top of the, the rut that they've dug themselves into, but they're not completely able to pull themselves out of that entrenched state into some for, uh, to some increased level of expression, some increased level of understanding, and some further, some further comprehension. And so again, they stay crystallized and stuck in that rut until they can have the wherewithal, the understanding, and the comprehension to see that they are stuck and that they need to, what is generally termed, impose a higher rhythm to find some way to achieve outside of this limitation. Now, first of all, you have to understand you have a limitation, which we all have limitations. Um, it's just a matter of how we choose to deal with our limitations once we realize we have a limitation and to move past that whole, that whole concept. And so there are many ways we can impose a new rhythm. Again, it first of all, uh, starts with understanding ourselves. Man, know thyself. Understand your motivation, your thinking, and start to understand in your own cognitive process why you do the things you do. Why is it that I feel comfortable in this routine? Why is it that I feel comfortable in this rut, in this ritual that I've created for myself and why is it that I feel compelled 
And many times it's a compulsion. We understand that word compulsion. Many, t many times we're compelled to, to do these certain things over and over again. But again, once we understand, have a level of awareness, then we have an opportunity to move forward and again, impose a higher rhythm, impose by will, an exercise of the will, because all of these routines are ultimately tied in the emotional nature, in our desire nature, because we're wanting something, and so we find ourselves caught in this little rut. So by this desire process t taking root, and firmly entrenching itself, the only way to overcome that is by a higher rhythm, which comes from mind, imposing one's will. And so, as Tom Moyer said, you carry the will, and that is very important. We are the arbiters. We're the... We're the ones that carry out and, and, and make our will happen. And some have a better understanding of how to do that, and some have a lesser understanding. And the more we can understand how to get our thinking squared away and understand at some level why we do these things that we do, we can make some moves to get out of this rut that I've spoke of. I would like to grab a couple of calls to see what's going on. Hello, caller. Hi, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Could you give us an example of a rut that you've been in and how you impose your will against that rut and how you got out of it? Hmm, there were probably a lot of examples, but uh, uh, a good one, I guess, would be an ex uh, a relationship that I was in for a long time. Uh, I was with this girl for like eight years, and so we were almost common-law married and all those kind of good things. And after we, I moved away uh, from her, and we sort, of decide, we sort of decided that we wouldn't see each other and all that good stuff, I had to detach myself from that situation. And I had to det detach myself from the emotional nature and detach myself from the concept of having to be with another person for to be fulfilled and to, to feel whole and that sort of thing. And um, I would say that the way I found a way out was by embracing uh, spirituality to, to uh, fall back on what St. Paul described as Christ in you, the hope of glory, and understanding that we have latent inside of ourselves a capacity to get past these sorts of things. And I could think of other examples too, but that's probably the biggest overcoming that I had to do personally was to emotionally get past. And, and, and now, um, you know, I still feel like I love that person, but at a much higher level, not at a personal level. You know what I mean? They've moved on, they're married now. So, I mean, that's kind of out of the picture in that sense anyway. But just the fact that I was, and it was a long process, but just the fact that I was able to bring something in to replace that 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 void that I felt. I felt it really uh, like part of me was gone, ripped from me at that point. You and think so, that's an example of you having imposed your will. Sure. Yes, because I was able to use my cognitive will and my thinking process to say, "Hey," to to understand where I was coming from, to understand why I felt that way, why I was so attached to this person, the concept of being in a relationship, uh, the fear of being by myself, and again that whole void. You know what I mean? Could I was, it be uh, something as simple as love that you felt? I'm sorry? Could it be something as simple as love that you felt? And well, yes, I would something say. Something that could be viewed as negative for your desire for another person. Well, again, I would say it's love. love, but again, love, it can be personal or it can be impersonal. And so I just transmuted, if you will, a personal love for one person into an all-inclusive love in the sense that I still have love for her, but not at the personal level, that I look at her as a soul attached to a physical vehicle, and so I have at that level a sense of love, and you know, for her family and things like that. But just on a larger, in a larger sense, love for a more inclusive sense of love on a, on a large scale. And so uh, that would be one example. Is there anything else that you care to add? No, that's okay. Okay, thanks Bye. for your call. I appreciate that. Okay, let's go ahead and grab another call. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hi. I like your show, and Thanks. I like your allusion to Socrates about know yourself. Mm hmm sure. And can you follow up on that, recommend any books or writers on this topic you're talking about? Hmm. Uh, I always am a little hesitant to recommend books per se because that's kind of a subjective thing. What's good for me and what's, you know, given me some understanding may not be what's best for everyone else. Um, but as far as uh, if you want to read some of the philosophers, the Greek philosophers obviously were very well aware of that. So you could go back and read some Greek philosophy. And then as far as um, some of the movements that have tried to bring that ideology, some of that, that, that concept to the West in the more recent times uh, would be like an organization called the Theosophical Society, a lady named Helena Blavatsky. Uh, although 
there are plenty of people that don't care for her as well, but uh, that's one organization that's done, that their different members have, have wrote, written so many things along those lines. Um, and there are all kinds of different uh, schools of thought and, and different organizations. Uh, you know, if you go to a metaphysical section in a, in a, uh, in a bookstore, you're likely going to find something along those lines. I would say just whatever appeals to you personally. Uh, some people are more, they want more of a religious style uh, inspiration. And so maybe if they could read uh, St. Teresa of Avila or St. John of the Cross, if they're from a Christian dispensation, maybe that would be something that would uplift them and, and get them to know themselves at a, at a more intimate level. Uh, maybe for other, others it's reading the Quran. You know, it may depend on your own individual, what, what appeals to you personally. And so uh, there is plenty of information out there. Oftentimes it hides in plain sight. But I would say if you have an earnest uh, desire, if you really, really, in your heart of hearts, want to know yourself better, then you'll find the means by which to do that. Okay. Is there anything else you care to add? Um, no, I, a book that influenced me a lot was, if you're familiar with Hesse, Hermann Hesse. Uh, uh, the German philosopher? Uh, yeah, writer. He mainly wrote literature, and he wrote a really great book called Damien, which means... Mm -hmm. I believe means soul. Oh, Damon, yes, right. That Damon. does mean, right, that does mean. It's like demon, but uh, D-A-E-M-O-N. D-E-M-I-A-N, I think. Oh, is it right? He won well, the Nobel Prize for Literature, and this particular book was about I inward looking uh, self reflection. Mm -hmm. I'm not summarizing it very well, but it was, a long, it was exactly what you're talking about. It's about 100 pages, it's not very long. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I, I, can't say, I can't say that I'm familiar with that specifically, but uh, the concept of a daemon as far as it being the soul or being the inner aspect of oneself, I am familiar with that concept. Huh. Thank you for your call. Okay, thank you. Have a nice evening. Let's see, I'll grab another call. Hello, caller. Howdy, howdy. How are you? Uh, good, good. This is Mo. I've been wanting to share this for some time. Short thought uh, mm -hmm. is that it's just per perpetually problematic to refer to, uh, to make the distinction uh, to say white magic and black magic uh, and referring, uh, referencing good with uh, uh, the color white and black as wicked. And I think it would be just a better thing to uh, just say, uh, to not draw the colors into it. And I, I say that, you know, uh, Seriously, and that that sort of uh, brings up all sorts of nuttiness. And better just to say uh, nurturing or wicked, because we know that the night is not frightening just because it's dark, or that its intent is wicked. Just the sun has gone elsewhere. But just in keeping with the theme that you had spoken of mm -hmm. at the end of every show, I heard you mention uh, the starship esoterica mm -hmm. i just thought i'd throw that in for my two cents that's i appreciate that that's that's a very good point i appreciate cool. that thank you very much uh, i would say basically as far as that goes it really boils down to motive more so motive is really the key in that as far as how you would determine what's white as opposed to black magic uh really the process in most instances is the same it's just your motive that factors in and just because uh Black, you know, is the absence of light. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that it's bad. It's just that there is it's a polar opposite, and so it has its place just as in the same sense that a, a white magic, so-called, if you will, does. Also, that everything has its place in the sun. It's just again, it would have to to, to boil down more so to motive, in my estimation. And ultimately, for, you want to get down to methodology in the sense of the science of it all. A black magician is only able to work from the astral or the plane of desire, the plane whereon we find oneself, we find oneself after death, and in the dream state at night when we find ourselves on that plane. That is the plane that, that the black magician, if you will, has mastered, and that's why they have seemingly more apparent power on the physical plane because they're very intimately working with the desire aspect. And so that has its own uh, connotations, if you will, as far as what their goals are, what their purposes are. And that's why always 
uh, Christ and the Church Invisible, working from the level of mind, working from the causative level, have uh, much more potency because they're coming from a higher, if you will, place. They're coming from a more spiritual place. And so their motive, by virtue of that position, overrides the negative, although or not necessarily negative, because that's all boils down to perception as well. And I, uh, true, I would even say that the perception of black magic versus white magic can be limiting, and that can be a prison of its own as well. Because dark and light, light both exist for a reason. We have male, female, we have all these polarities for a reason. So there, it, is for, it is not for no reason that that exists. There is definite cause behind the fact that we have seeming evil in the world although that is a relative term ultimately and that is a, a good thing to bring up so I thank you for that that call hello caller yeah I have a qu another question what what leads you to believe that there is that you have had a past life and that you have debts to pay in this life for any actions you might have took in the past life that's a good question uh, I would say that has to do with certain people and this is all subjective, so this has to do with what each individual person uh, believes. I'm talking about you. Talking me personally? About you. Okay, me personally. Things that I've found that I've recaptured. Uh, places that have seemed ultra familiar. Teachings that I reread that are just, it's just way too familiar. That I've known this. I just feel intuitively, beyond any shadow of questioning, that I've known this information at another previous time. And then I find people coming into my life as well that I had to, I feel that I have had to have some interaction with at some level at some previous time uh, because I don't believe in coincidence and I see how this larger pattern is weaving and working itself out and I see how from my little small perch I'm able to you know have this weaving just like the spider I spoke of earlier you know you weave your own environment and, and so I Sorry about that, I think I lost my calls. But anyway, uh, just to finish up on that, as far as my personal feelings that I've had some sort of past life situation, um, I would say it just uh, largely boils down to an intuitive sense and also uh, my understanding, my personal conviction that the whole idea of the one-shot deal and that, um, that we get one chance to get it right it just doesn't fly with me personally. I cannot, that logically makes no sense to me whatsoever that we would only have one chance and that uh, we would be expected to achieve some re relative level of perfection to attain some perceived afterlife. Now, if you don't have any belief in an afterlife or any kind of spiritual leanings, then it may not matter to you at all. But myself, being a spiritually minded person, I feel that uh, that has some significance and that. Um, it just, uh, and also I like the idea of people, multiple people dying on a plane crash. If 200 people get on a plane together, you know, is there some randomness that just, oh, that plane just happened to crash? 200 souls being all-knowing at some level are not going to get onto, into that situation without there being some pre-planning, if you will, some cognizance, understanding at some level that that is your need to be on that plane at that time because uh, we have limited time here and so uh, I mean it can change a little bit but more or less we're gonna have a, a limited fixed life expression and so when it's our time to go it's our time to go circumstances will set them up whether we get hit by a bus or whether we go on a plane crash or whether we get eaten by crocodiles it matters little when it's your time to go more or less you know again there are some reprieves in some instances but that's the rare instance when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And the idea that a little baby would die and that God had just killed the little baby, you know, the little baby's died and uh, oh, the little, our little girl has cancer or something like that. What is the justification? What is the reasoning behind that? To me, to just to say that, oh, that's God's will, well, you could take that stance if you want, but I want to get to the cause behind. What is the reasoning? What is the causative factor that led to that physical plane event of possibly you know, somebody having a hor horrendously disfiguring accident or, again, a young person, very young person dying of some fatal disease. What is the purpose behind all that? Just to say that, oh, it just happens, you know, it's just a random thing. I, I personally can't accept that. Also, reading from those that have gone on the same path, this esoteric path that I'm trying to find my way through as well, if you find the writings from early, the earliest antiquity forward, you find this common pattern of understanding 
that comes with a certain level of awareness, a certain level of understanding, a certain level of spirituality. Now that's going to be a hard thing for some people to swallow because you're going to, I, I'm throwing in that you have to have some spiritual leanings in order to have a fuller level of comprehension. And that's very true. The person with the not so spiritual stance is going to be centered in the lower nature. Once we make the spiritual uh, return and that's our, our level of approach, then, um, then those centers that are associated with this fuller understanding, this level of understanding more about divine law in relation to how how it affects us will be ours and we'll have the benefit of that. But again, it's a subjective thing. Each person has to make that determination on their own. I'm going to grab one more call quickly. Hello, caller. Could you make this very brief, please? Yes, this is in response to my previous question. Go ahead. What happened, it, it, the, you, it's clear the Earth has become overpopulated, well, not overpopulated, but much more highly populated in, in the past uh, thousand years, I say. Okay, I'm going to get you off air with that one. What happened to all the souls that... that okay, that, uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Hold on, I'll get you with that one. Uh, basically, the point being that, uh, well, the point being that uh, not all souls are, incarnation, are in our incarnation at the same time, and also there's an evolution, too, where lower kingdoms find their way into the human kingdom. Now, that's not an overnight process. That's a very slow process. But the units that are going to be individualized as a human conscious soul are somewhat set and determined. And so that being the case, there, there is a number, if you will, you can ascribe a number to the number of souls that are going to be in, in incarnation at any given time, out of in, incarnation in an afterworld situation, possibly learning lessons on a whole other evolution outside of our Earth evolution because that takes place as well, and also factoring in that there is evolution where the lower kingdoms find their way into the higher. And so uh, all that, and again, that's all that might be difficult to, to chew on that and to grasp, to grasp that without some, again, some subjective or some individual understanding of that concept. You can uh, read books all day long about it, but until you can bring that belief into yourself at some level, it's not going to mean anything to you. It's going to sound like a fairy tale. And so that's the difficulty between uh, an objective opinion that everybody shares and everybody can agree that, hey, that's a blue car over there, or more, more or less, and the things that are individual ideas, concepts, and that are subjective and that are limited to each individual person's perception. Again, perception, we are limited by our perceptions alone, so whatever our perception is is going to limit us. I don't believe I'm going to be able to get this last call. I have less than a minute left, but thank you for taking the time to call and, and uh, watch the show. Uh, I'd like to thank my producer, Chris, for commanding the helm of the Starship Esoterica. I'd like to encourage everybody to stay tuned for Chris Athanas and the Reality Expander television show coming up next. Uh, we'll be live next week uh, here on Channel 10 from 8 to 9 p.m. And our philosophical meetings that Jeff Contreras and myself host uh, will be next Wednesday, the 21st, uh, from 8 o'clock on, and there's a graphic there for it, or no, it's not actually, sorry. There's a graphic for it uh, that uh, explains the address and what have you. And so if everybody could come down and check that out, I would encourage everybody to come to the philosophical meeting. Uh, I'd like to, again, thank everybody for taking the time to view the show and uh, take note of the other awareness shows, if you will. And uh, thanks again, Austin, for taking the time to view Esoteric Science Roundtable. Have a nice evening. Thanks, Austin.